Hey, welcome back to Dear Baseball Gods, and this week we've got an awesome guest, Jeff Baginero, who will be the AAA pitching coach this upcoming season in 2019 for the Arizona Diamondbacks affiliate, the Reno Aces. So let's start back with him because he's got a really long, impressive career, and uh, I'm excited to get into it a little bit with him today. So Riverside Community College, uh, after which he transferred to Oklahoma, so he played for the Sooners, uh, Big Ten Baseball, obviously one of the best conferences in the country. He was a uh, first-team All-American as an outfielder and pitcher there. He uh, was a mid-'90s thrower and could just do it all. Uh, after being an OU captain, MVP of his 2000 team, he went on to play for the White Sox. He was drafted in the 36th round, uh, eventually made it to the big leagues uh, with both the White Sox and the Diamondbacks, uh, won a World Series ring with the White Sox in 05, which is very, very cool. And then he's also been a uh, three-time AA and AAA minor league all-star and uh, just had a ton of of baseball experience being all over the map as a reliever, as one of the hard-throwing kind of back-end guys. And then now as a coach, uh, he's been with the Diamondbacks since 2010. He was the Cal League Coach of the Year each of the last two seasons and uh, lists a ton of, uh, of minor league pl- uh, pitchers of the year and just some great arms that he's worked with and been integral in helping them move through the ranks and get to the big leagues as well. So um, he's been all over from both uh, as a two-way player playing big-time college baseball, also being not heavily recruited at all out of high school. So you'll hear that story from him today. And then uh, obviously making it to the big leagues as a, a lower-round draft pick, so the amount of 36th rounders who end up making it into the major leagues is is pretty slim. So it's impressive that he's uh, he's had such resolve, uh, especially amongst a bunch of injuries. So and, he's, and here's one of the reasons why he was voted in 2005 – uh, the minor league's hardest working pitcher. So great guest to have on here today. Welcome, Jeff Baginero. All right, so we're here right. with Jeff Baginero, who is out in Dallas, Texas, uh, in his off season. So Jeff, tell me about your past year, and uh, first of all, how is uh, how's Texas treating you? Texas is good. I'm actually uh, right outside Dallas in Arlington here about three, four years. Um, so it's good. I like in, I like the seasons that it has out here. I've lived in Arizona for about 11 years, so off seasons were great in Arizona, but definitely didn't have the season, so. I thought Texas didn't have seasons Yeah, That was just like a hot and then like slightly less deadly they, hot. <laughs> they have uh, mosquitoes uh, and humidity, and then they have fall and really cold, and that, that's about it, yeah. So, okay. So. Okay. I don't know what spring or summer is like, actually. I've never been here, so. Gotcha. So as I mentioned to you, I have hard feelings for Dallas because the only time I visited, my business partner and I, we had a booth at the ABCA convention back in <laughs> 2011. And I grew up with asthma. So I always got flu shots when I was a kid. So I never yeah. had the flu. And everyone, you know, like everyone whines about the flu. And I'm like, oh, I can't be that big a deal. So we have this booth <laughs> that we paid a lot of money for. And on the second day of the thing, it was in one of these huge like conference center hotels where you have to walk like a half a mile to get from your hotel room to like the the banquet center. And I'm walking down there. I started feeling a little bit bad the previous night and I had to just stop. And I looked at Lucas and I'm like, I I just can't, I can't walk anymore. I got to go back. And then I just basically prayed for death in my hotel room for the next like two days. And then we flew home and there was a terrible like blizzards everywhere. So then I got snowed in the Detroit airport and, uh, I had just like a light jacket because it was still warm in Dallas and I didn't pack very heavy. And I was just like wandering around the, the this airport shivering. And I, I remember I asked the security guard, I said, hey, is there like an infirmary or like somewhere I can go to like, like, what do you do with sick people? And he's like, nah. So I just huddled. I huddled. I've got a lot of those little crappy blankets. And I just like huddled in the corner and just shivered for the entire night. And I got a flight home the next day at like two o'clock. And uh I just wondered, I'm like, you can't just like, sh- like shivering is a sign that your body is in trouble. I'm like, what happens if you shiver like for a whole day? Do you just like, you just turn off, or you just die? I, I don't know. But so that's, that's how I feel about Dallas. I Well, well hopefully you got flu. a middle middle seat on the way home. That would have been great. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so last year and the previous year, you were Cal League Coach of the Year with the uh, Visalia Rawhide. And then you are... Yeah. Now promoted, you're the new AAA pitching coach for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yeah. So tell, um, tell me about that. So how did you make the jump? Uh, how did that go this this winter? Um, yeah, it was great. Um, 
those awards are awesome and all that. Seriously, I, I mean, I'm I'm proud of getting them and all that, but it's it's you know how it is. It's all about the pitchers and and a lot of it's what I do, but you know that could go to anybody. So that's cool. Um, being promoted was awesome. You know, I spent three years in Visalia and it was really good. Good three years. Cali's great. I loved it. Um, my mom actually, my mom's sister, brother, and grandmother all live. Two grandmas, both all live in San, Southern California. So uh, anytime we went south, I got to just drive and visit with them um, for the game, after the game, whatever. Um, so that was great. Travel best in – it has to be the best in the minor leagues by Silly because we're right in the middle of all the teams in Cali, and nothing's farther than four hours. So it was awesome. Um, I've heard the ball really flies there. Is that true? That's tough to pitch in it. Yeah, there's a couple spots, but you know what? They've Bakersfield's gone. Bakersfield's gone now. High Desert's gone, which was that was an airport. Um, Lancaster is what it is, and you know everybody knows. But that's that's really the place, Lancaster, and that's everywhere else is pretty fair to be honest with you. Ranchos flies a little bit, but Lake Elsinore is pretty pretty big, and um, Modesto's large too. So it's not what it used to be, but it's still not easy. So, yeah. And then I've heard, so you're moving up to the Pacific coast league, right? And, yes, and then I, you spent time there as a player, correct? Yeah. I spent 2006 in a PCL with Tucson. I was with the Diamondbacks. Um, that was eye opening because I came from the IL international league and I, you know, you look at my baseball card, I had ridiculous numbers and I go over to the PCL and I think I jumped three runs. On, right. And everyone's like, no, you're actually pitching great. I'm like, I got a four and a half. And everyone's like, no, seriously. And I actually got promoted for a couple of days that year. I'm just going, what kind of a league is this? Like, yeah, it was, it was shocking. Um, Cause not only the ball flies, it's like, you might come back from a road trip in June, you know, right after spring's over, you know, late May and the grass is, was almost gone just cause of the watering regulations in Tucson back in the day. So you're playing on concrete where the ball flies. Every base hit is a triple or double <laughs> gap. It's just – it was really incredible. So you learned to pitch, that's for sure. Yeah. I had a uh, – so I remember when Noah Syndergaard got called up, you know, five, six years ago, whatever it was now, and everyone was talking about him, talking about him. And I'm, like, looking him up. I'm, like, the guy has, like, a five. For, what was he? For, he was in Vegas. I'm like, oh. how is he ready? Like, how does this make sense? But then I had teammates <laughs> who played in the in the D back system and some others who were like, no, that's actually pretty good there. I'm like, that's so weird. Yeah, that is, it really is. You, you you have to learn how to pitch and survive, straight up survive, because you'll go nuts, and some guys do. And it's just the thin air. Is it just like small ballparks? Is it just jet streams, or what, what's the the factor? Most of it's the thin air, and it's mostly more, you know, West Coast. Um, but, again, some of the fields get hard in the summer. Yeah. Um, I know Reno, the ball flies, Tucson, it flew, um, Albuquerque, El Paso. Shoot, man. It's it just – I don't know. It's just the way it is. Now, IL has got that thicker air, the southern southern teams, eastern. Ball didn't go. I mean, I played in Charlotte, the old ballpark, and, I mean, it was like – 310 down the line, 340 in the gaps, maybe. It was short. You look back and you're like, oh, my gosh. And a guy would get into one, and you're like, you wouldn't even turn around. You just put your head down. And it's a fly out on the warning track. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So definitely plays different. Yeah. I heard stories about it, about guys trying to get just a feel for the ball and, like, pouring yeah. cups of water on their pants just yeah. so they have something. Like, is that a common thing? Is that a real yeah, story? Yeah, I mean, I – I never did it, um, and I to be honest, I never saw guys do it. But I have since I've coached. I've seen, heard about it, and um, just to get a feel. Even when I pitched in Double A in Mobile, well, I pitched in Birmingham with the White Sox, but we'd go to Mobile, and humidity was bad. Everyone was suddenly, but when you get to Mobile, I mean, it was just in the Gulf, and you, I was dripping. I literally look down as I'm getting my sign, and my fingertips, I you know, I hold them down on my side, would just be sweat would be pouring off. There'd be a puddle on the ground where I was waiting for get my pitch call. And I just, I had no feel for the pitch and all I could throw was a fastball. It was really miserable, but you know, I was a sweater too. So, (laughs) (laughs) 
So one of the reasons you had to find creative, you had to find creative ways to get by. Yeah, and I'm sure guys probably don't use uh, rosin very much in climates like that either. And I think that's one of those rosin's a really weird substance. Were you like a big rosin guy? Um, not really. I mean, you kind of had to be in the humidity, but even then, the bag was just soaked. Yeah, muddy, sweaty, disgusting bag. It was worthless. Yeah, it's one of those substances where you need it the most when it's cold and dry, but then rosin mm-hmm. also helps the least when it's cold and dry. And when it's humid yeah. and wet, it's like super sticky, but then you have like way too much. And right. you're just like throwing it and it just like sticks to you, hits the the mound almost. And yeah, it's uh, it's I was, good when you don't need it. That's true. I was never a guy that could use pine tar or anything like that. or st- I couldn't use the sunscreen. It just, I didn't like the stick. I wanted to come off my fingers. And so I, I don't know. It, didn't help me at all. I was trying to dry my hands. I would find like only thing I could ever find was this golfer's dry grip stuff. It looked like white out and you just pour it on your hand and it basically turned your hand white and it kind of restricted your pores, I guess. Hmm. It helped a little bit for about 10 pitches and then you're done. And that was it. So you had to eject- hope for a quick ejected inning. before then. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the reasons I wanted to have have you on here, Jeff, because uh, you've got a really interesting story. So on your bio here, it says that at age 15, you were told you were never going to pitch again. Um, can you elaborate on that for me? Um, yeah, and let me backtrack real quick because, I mean, that is part of my story is kind of the, the run to the litter type of thing. You can't do it. So when I was 13 – I was in freshman year history class and I do like a career project, you know? And so I was heavy into baseball. Um, obviously, I mean, I, I read the box scores when I was eight years old at the, eating my cereal, you know, I'm just, I love the game. I love trying to figure out the game and the box scores. We didn't have, you know, media like we do today. So anyways, I did it on being, I want to be a baseball player, you know, like any smart kid at that age would play ball. So, I interviewed a, a guy that played minor league ball. He was one of my coaches in Little League. He went to like A ball or something, and he was like 50 years old. But great guy, taught me how to throw a knuckleball. And I interviewed him. He told me about his story. You know, I did a 10 page paper on baseball. I want to be a ball player. So I got my paper back, and I got like, I think I got an A minus to be honest. I don't know what it was. It was A minus or B plus. And he said, great paper. You would have gotten an A or a full A, A plus, but that's not a real job. Uh, so that was like my first intro to, Oh, really? Like kind of pissed me off. I'm going to show you. So then at 15, yeah, I had some arm issues. I was a sophomore in high school and going into my junior year. And, uh, I kept going to see his doctor and I had to get an ulnar nerve transposition, just moved my money bone basically over. Um, it was rubbing and, and, I had gone back in after the surgery and it was something was still bugging me. And I think the guy was just getting tired of me, you know, <laughs> seeing me and my dad come in. And I actually found it the other day and I showed my wife, I have my doctor's notes and in it, I highlighted it. It said, you should probably try to find another position because you're not going to pitch again. You shouldn't pitch again. And I, I read it, but when he said it to me, I mean, I remember 15 years old, I was crying like in the doctor's room going like, what? I mean, I obviously I played other positions. I was still young, but it was devastating to hear a grown man tell me that I thought was a baseball guy. Tell me, you're not going to pitch again. You can't pitch again. So it just, it really drove me like from ages 16 to 21, really, you know, and uh, into high school and into college. So I, I ended up pitching junior and senior year, um, but I was a really small guy. Um, I skipped fourth grade. I was, you know, a little advanced when I was younger. So I graduated at 17 years and like two months old or two months. And so I was super young, wasn't developed, but I had great numbers and all that. So I got no looks from colleges, didn't know where I was going to go. Um, so that's kind of the, kind of the background of that story. So when you say you're small, how, like, like what size? Cause I think this is something I, I try to get our high school kids, our junior high kids to understand more than anything that they need to eat they need to really work hard to be physical mm-hmm. but even then like you can still make it so like what was your height and weight when you're graduating high school <sighs> graduating i'd i would say about five ten maybe maybe five eleven at that point 
weight was 165, 170, I guess. Um, I was just behind too. I was a year younger, so I wasn't developed. I just started lifting weights my junior year. I mean, I didn't even, it's not like it was today, but I would definitely, yeah. if you're in high school, you should be lifting, you know, I think. Um, but I'm not the professional there. Um, but yeah, it's underdeveloped. I was probably throwing maybe 84, 86, but I had ridiculous numbers, you know, and there was dudes in my team that were big and developed and strong. And my junior year, I think we ranked two in the nation preseason. We didn't even make the playoffs that year, but we just had these beasts on our team that ASU, USC, we had three guys drafted and, you know, I just got overlooked which is understandable. Mm -hmm. but, so you went through junior college, and then tell me about your transformation there, because I know where you transferred, I'll let you tell it, but um, tell me about um, junior college. Well, out of high school, the only place that showed any interest, I actually got a look at Dartmouth, but that was never followed through. Um, I went Pomona Pitzer. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a Division three school in Southern California. I've heard of Pomona. They gave me a small little – kind of look and I just I did not want to go there no offense to that school I just I wanted to go to a big D1 my dream my goal I want to play in the College World Series and I ended up kind of settling uh, I walked on a D2 at UC Riverside my first year at the time it was D2 and I wanted to just play a position and not worry about pitching they wanted me to pitch and so I kind of would go do the pitching stuff do my bullpen I wouldn't do the running immediately hit and do all the drills in the field and the pitching coach hated me because he's like he's ditching out of running and I go no no I'm gonna run after practice I just I'm doing both and they're like you're not doing both and long story short I basically made the team as an outfielder which I never played outfield before as a true freshman at 17 and I hurt my shoulder in January so I was like gosh man I can't stay healthy and at that point I played summer ball I grew a lot in summer ball like bigger, stronger, turned into like a true freshman. Mm -hmm. And um, I transferred to Riverside Junior College in California. And that was like the best decision I ever made. Just as far as what I got there and the teaching and the coaching. And Dennis Rogers is just a legend in the game. And he taught me about the mental game of baseball and just untapped a lot that was deep within me that I didn't know I had. Um, visualization, all that stuff. I mean, I didn't know anything about that. And I truly feel it helped me, even though I don't know if I was doing it right, you know, but mm -hmm. good. So I, I think a lot of kids and parents turn their nose up at junior college. And I know, especially in, you know, bigger areas. I mean, there's a, a really strong junior college in my town right here. It's a small town, Bloomington, Illinois, but Heartland Community College is an excellent program. Um, do you think too many kids and parents, because obviously you're an instructor and uh, obviously you're a professional pitching coach. Do you feel like too many people kind of stick their nose up at junior college and f don't think it's, like, worth their time? My my experience, yes. I mean, I do lessons in the off season and work with kids and high school, Juco guys, whatever. And, yeah, it's some of the high school parents really – they want a Division One, Division Two NAI. They want a scholarship for their kid. They don't want to sit in the junior college. From what I've heard – um, I'm, I'm for them as far as if you don't have a place to go, it's a, it's a cheaper alternative. It's a place to develop and grow. You're going to probably play if you're decent, if you, if you fight and work and I mean, you're going to get looked at. I mean, it's just bottom line. I did. I had, had a ton of looks out of that junior college and all the guys on my team, not all of them, but like eight guys got scholarships to good programs from that school. So I don't think things have changed. I think it's a great alternative for those kids that haven't, they're not throwing what they should throw yet, or they haven't grown in their bodies, you know, everyone develops different ages. So yeah, you can get buried as a freshman, you're going to redshirt at a big time D1 and you know, odds are you, you're not going to play much unless you're a dude, you know? So it's a good alternative for sure. So what were you like uh, profile-wise when you started to get to rec get recruited after that junior college season? I mean, how hard were you throwing? You said you got a lot taller and filled out. What was uh, the high school kid who was 84 to 86 and 5'10"? What, did, what were you at that point? And what schools were interested in you? Um, so I redshirted my freshman year at UC Riverside. I went to Riverside 
community college. Um, played my freshman year as a third baseman and left fielder. I only hit. I hit pretty good, but whatever. Um, I hit the weight room hard. Didn't know what I was doing, but I got huge. You know, it's back in the day of creatine and stuff. <laughs> you know what you're doing, but you just did it to get bigger and stronger, and it worked. Brady Anderson, yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't go there. Well, <laughs> well, I'm, I just he he's like <laughs> eat whole boxes of creatine. Like, oh, okay. Like, that's not the way you take it. I wasn't talking about any of the other stuff. Yeah, but like, yeah. I remember he would eat like a whole thing of creatine a day. Yeah. Which you're just like peeing it out. Like it doesn't, <laughs> it's just like not the, right. not the right way to take it. Anyway. Probably, yeah. I'm an so, Orioles, I'm an Orioles uh, native. Yeah. I'm not really an Orioles fan. I'm wearing a cool hat, but uh, yeah, I know, I know about Brady Anderson. So I anyway. got you. Yeah. You went from like what, 12 to 50? Yeah. Anyways, so yeah. Um, so then my sophomore year, I go back. I'm, I'm the right fielder only. And that's all I'm doing. I'm hitting. I'm hitting really well. And I think it was in. So our season ended late May. I think it was about May 10th or so. I'd go into the bullpen one day just to mess around because guys were throwing. And I got off the mound and I was throwing really hard. And so someone grabbed a gun and I was like 95, 96. And I hadn't been on the mound in two years. So it was straight up, no pitching, lifting, doing all that stuff, long tossing. My long toss partner, my freshman year, is Bobby Kelty. I don't know if you know him. Played in the I big, remember the name. He had a big red afro. He was with the A's and the Red Sox. Anyways, he goes, the first day I was there, he was a sophomore, I was a freshman. He goes, you're going to throw with me every day. And I go, all right. And he just goes out. I mean, he goes foul, pull to foul, whatever. He just – I couldn't keep up. But I eventually started making some gains and, and keeping up with him. My arm got really strong. Um and I, I have no doubt the combination of lifting and growing and long toss, I gained about 10 miles an hour. And I mean, it was two and a half years, but so long story short, I threw 10 innings my sophomore year. Like I would just come in from right field in the eighth or ninth, throw two innings. And I got drafted in the 13th round. And I was like, what? They yeah, offered me a little bit of money, but I really wanted to go play in college. So, I was recruited by um, Arkansas. I took a trip, Oral Roberts, Long Beach State, UCLA. I had some big schools, you know. It was it was great. Oklahoma. That's what I ended up signing with, and I got a full ride there. And I just so I turned down the the money they offered and went there to be a two way guy. So. Yeah, my dad's actually a, a Sooner as well. He ran track um, back in. Gosh, when was that? late 60s so yeah. interesting connection norman oklahoma awesome. i've been there i've been there nice yeah so it was a great school yeah so you play two-way and uh tell me about playing two-way in college because not many guys can hack that and uh i think you hit the most home runs of anyone i can think of except for tim hudson who played i'm two-way. trying to think of someone else who else you gotta miss helton come on helton? todd helton was two-way I know Micah yes. Owings. I know Micah Owings, fellow. Micah D-back. Owings, Todd Helton are the ones I think about. I didn't Bob- know Todd Helton did that. Bobby Thigpen. Okay. Okay. Anyways, yeah. <clears throat> so I got there my junior year. I'm playing right field. I, I sucked. I I killed it in the fall, and then I just sucked getting out of the gate. And we had a we had a player behind me. His name is Valentino Pascucci. I think he's at 400 minor league home runs. He played in the big leagues with a couple teams and. He was my backup in right field, and he was also a pitcher. And I, I can remember my coach in junior college calling me and going, hey, that he keep asking me, I, I got to bench this bad Gennaro kid. He can't hit. He's all – and my coach from JUCO is like, stick with him. He'll, he will produce. Trust me. Stuck with me. They, I hit okay. I think hit 300 or something. And um, pitched okay, but senior year was a lot better. I was comfortable. Hit a lot better. Came in from right field, no warm up and close games. It was it was a, it was it was fun. <laughs> Taking off my tape, running in, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you switch the your gloves was, or do you stay with like the thirteen inch glove on the I, No, <laughs> I would switch gloves, but then I'd get ripped on for wearing eye black. I'm like, what are you gonna do? I don't. I'm not gonna go to the bathroom. And get some of those like Burt's Bees like uh, makeup wipes. <laughs> <laughs> there on the mat. Yeah. No, it so, was that it was so it was a great time though. How uh, how demanding is it to 
to play two way. Obviously, with Otani and the big leagues, and uh, even it's it's still even pretty rare. I think for D one guys, especially big D one guys, to be able to hack it. I mean, like you said, throwing your bullpen, then running out and doing all your position player stuff. How demanding is that? I mean, do you think most guys can handle it? I think more guys can handle it. They think. I mean, it's definitely taxing on your arm. You're doing infield, outfield all the time. I pretty much – my coaching staff was great. I mean, they, they let me not do it a lot of times. But I just didn't want to be that guy that didn't do stuff. So i just throw through pain. i throw through soreness, which wasn't smart. Um but I mean, it's definitely demanding. They they you know cut my running a little bit because you know back then we just straight ran poles. You know, it's yeah. poles and we run in this like thick chunky rocks on the warning track in our spikes in pants. You know, you do those time poles. I'm like, oh, this is miserable. Everyone got shin splints. Yeah, <laughs> but they backed off of that stuff a little bit. And I think if you have a coach that's understanding, realizing that you're getting a guy, you're getting a two for one deal right here. So you may be getting a full ride, but you're really given a 50% scholarship here and a 50% there if this guy actually, you know, does something for you. Yeah, I never thought about that way. It's an interesting perspective. Especially when you got scholarship limits and all that. I mean, you gotta be the right guy and you gotta it worked out for me. It was tough, but it was it was awesome too. It was freeing knowing that I can go jump on the mound and then I get to bat next inning second or whatever. It was just it was really liberating. It allowed me to just be who I was. And so how did that evolve? So obviously you're successful as a two-way player, and then the draft comes. So, I mean, were you aware you had to make a choice? Are teams talking to you about, hey, we're only going to draft you like as a position player, or only as a pitcher? Or like, How did that all kind of shake out? Yeah, my junior year I got drafted in the 36th round, but I pretty much told them I was going back to school. You know, still pick me, trying to sign me. Um <laughs> I want to go to the College World Series, and I'm bad. And so I just said, no. I mean, if I'm good enough, I'll get signed next year. Um, but, yeah, I, I, want, I didn't know. I thought I might have a chance as a hitter, even though I realized, like, I couldn't run. I'd steal some bases, but I was smart. I wouldn't fast at all. And I realized that's where it was at. I was a self-made type of hitter. I wasn't a natural, man, look at that swing. You know, I was. it wasn't pretty. Done. And I hit some home runs, but it was – it was ugly, to be honest with you, looking back on it. But uh, so my senior year, we lost to UCLA in the, in the regional that we hosted. The night after the game was over, the same night, my the scout that um, tried to sign me the year before, back then you could still do the draft and follow. Yeah. Senior. So I ended up signing, I think, the next day. Um, didn't go back in the draft and, you know, gave me a little bit of money and not too much, but. And he was really good to me, and I wanted to kind of stay with them for sticking by me. So, Can you explain to uh, – because the draft and follow has been going for a long time now. Can you explain to our uh, our listeners kind of just about that process? Um, I think the way it used to work was as a, in junior college, you can get drafted as a freshman. If you say, I don't want to sign, I think that team has an opportunity to sign you after your sophomore year before the draft occurs again, I think. And then the same thing goes for fifth-year seniors. If you get drafted your junior year, after your senior year, same situation. They have a chance to try and sign you before you go back in. So so it's like after the season ends, like the seven days before the draft? Or is it, isn't that like the cutoff I, or something I believe, like that? I believe so because I met with him that same night we lost the game, and I was like, I don't even want to think about this right now. Yeah. It was reality, so. Yeah, I had a buddy who was a, a draft and follow as well. I think he was like a like – a, 40th round pick coming off Tommy John, real big hard throwing lefty, and then went through his uh, I think junior season at Delaware, and then as soon as that season was over, they were like waiting with a contract. So yeah, yeah, that was interesting. It was pretty much the same deal, and you know to be honest, I didn't. I had a great senior year. I mean, I had 20 saves, I hit 340, a couple home runs, and I was like. I don't know what I would get if I went in the draft. I don't know where I'd go. I didn't have anyone talking to me. I was very naive about the whole process. Um, I had heard anywhere from third to second to fifth at one point, and then I heard, you're not going to get any money, $1,000, no matter where you go. So why wouldn't you take a little bit more that he's offering? So clue. And I was always curious, like, what, where would I have gone? But that's all that was was a pride thing, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't I love – 
regardless if that was accurate or not, I don't, I don't care. I love it because it's something that I get to tell my players or when they ask and, you know, look me up on Google and they say, you were 36 round pick. Go, yeah. And I made it. You can make it too. You know, it's, it's just part of the story. So. Yeah. So speak to that a little bit. I mean, cause now you're a coach and you know, you get all these new guys in, you know, who got $4 million and you know, who got, you know, a thousand bucks. How does that all play into, you know, someone ascending the minor league ladder? Um, I mean, I, I get to use it because of what I just told you, my story. Um, I can't relate to the million dollar guy, but I played with a lot of those guys. Um, and they're, they have the same issues that everybody else does, you know, probably more to be honest with you. There's more pressure on those guys. They have to make it. Otherwise they're a failure. They're not, but that's how they'd be perceived in their eyes. Um, the thing as a coach now that I love, I, I, no matter if you sign for a box of baseballs or a grand or $4 million, I will pour into each of those guys the same exact way. And people go, Oh, that's, that's crap. You're not going to, you're not going to spend as much time with that guy. Well, I will, if they're willing to work. I mean, of course the million dollar guy may get more chances by the organization, but as far as on the field, you know, grinding out working, uh, it doesn't matter to me. We're going to work and we're going to get better. And I mean, that's, that's just bottom line. I don't care who it is, but um, as far as the story of where I was drafted, I get, I, I do get to use that on both, on both sides of it. So, yeah. And I saw one of your, your accolades, you were voted the hardest working pitcher in the White Sox organization. So they have, they have, they have guys in the trees, like logging your hours, running polls. Um, I mean, but like, like, tell me, talk about work ethic in the minor leagues, because I don't think most people understand, like you said, what a grind it is. I think the word grind is a really trendy hashtag on social media. Oh, yeah. What, what, tell me what it means to you. Cause I, I know what it means to me, but I'd like to hear what it, what it means to you. Yeah. I used to love the word grind and now I hate it because people that don't grind use it like they do grind. And I just, it grinds my gears. <laughs> it's just, I'm like, you have no idea what this means and you, Oh, it just drives me nuts. But nevertheless, um, I mean, minor league season for guys that don't know, I mean, from April 4th, let's say that's opening night till the end of May, you, you might have a day off. You probably have one day off in that time period, possibly two. And then there, you know, there's a few more sprinkled in throughout the year, but that first month and a half is rough. It's 45 days, one day off. And, you know, that's the beginning of the year when guys, a lot of guys only go five, six innings or your pitch counts are limited. So bullpen gets taxed. Um, you know, the grind of the travel, the bus rides, you know, in the minor leagues, you're not taking flights unless you're in AAA. And even if you're in AAA, those flights are at 3.30 because you got to get the cheap flight at 5 or 6 in the morning. So you end a game at, let's say, 10.30. You get out of the field at 11.15, 11.30 early, and you got to wake up at 3.30 for their flight. And you're wound up from the game and the energy, so you're not going to bed till 1. Um that's to me that's true grind not to mention all the work you got to put in all the mental you have to stay so mentally locked in if you take a day or a week off your your whole season can be screwed you, you know so that when it comes august and you see these guys just still going strong still competing still working still doing everything they did on april 5th or 4th like those are the guys you know have a chance, but you see the guys that cash it in and just stop working and stop showing up, and you're like, all right. I mean, it's it sucks, but that's the way it is, you know. Um, but the grind is it can mean so many different things. The minor league season is, is really really tough, um, but it's also great. Yeah. So, what do you think separated you from other guys? I don't mean this to like. You know, I, know. I know you're not you're not you're a, a, a very humble guy i can tell just in the hour we've been talking but i mean what do you think helped keep your ship afloat i guess maybe is the way i could put it because there's a ton of ups and downs i know you had some injuries you know there's just always those nagging pains there's getting promoted and then getting sent down there's so many different things what did you do to keep yourself even level well the one thing that my dad and my parents both, when my dad worked on me, you know, in the yard when I was a kid, he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't, he didn't like baseball. He made fun of his best friend because he played baseball. He said, oh, you guys are a bunch of little 
little guys running around touching all the white fluffy. You know? that, that was my dad. He played football, you know, track. He did air, basketball. He did all these other sports, but never played baseball. So when I was born, he had no clue how to teach me the game. But he taught me how to work, and that was – invaluable every single day i'd come home from school he built a little dirt mound in the backyard he bought these crappy shin guards in this 1960s pancake catcher's glove and he would catch me for three innings and i had to strike everybody out you know to get an out so i mean i don't who knows how many pitches i threw that's probably why i blew out five times <laughs> but not not really but he instilled in me a work ethic and then we hit ground balls he ended up installing a batting cage in our backyard um, I would hit every single day. I mean, it just I worked. I mean, follow that into pro ball, into high school, into college, where no one wanted me. I couldn't do it. You're not going to play. It's not a real. Job. And this just drove me my whole life. People tell me I couldn't do it, and then my dad teaching me how to work. So I, you know, I finally get into pro ball, and the only thing I had to take with me was. I wrote this in my hat on day one in pro ball, and my buddy made fun of me every day. He'd steal my hat and read what I wrote. Oh, no one gets in my way. <laughs> That's what I wrote. And I was like, corny as it was, like that had to be my thought process because I knew where I was coming from and I was a 36 round pick that no one wanted and it drove me. And so if anyone was, you know, working longer than me, I would go work when they weren't looking, I'd go back out and do something. We would run 15, you know, 75 yard sprints me and my buddy would go behind the stadium in Birmingham and run hills just before the game. Like we would lift at one, like heavy lifting, squatting. Then we'd go run at, let's say, 2.30 after our throwing. And then after that, we'd sneak out behind the stadium and run hills, like all the time. And just in my mind, all that did was instill that when that hitter steps in the box, there's no shot he worked harder than me, he can't beat me. There's, there's no way. And if he does, he got lucky. And so – some of that's, you know, may not be accurate, may not be true. A lot of guys are better than me, but my confidence level and, and what I thought about myself was higher than – it was as high as it can be, which I feel like gave me a huge edge. And I mean, I've worked with enough guys to see their stuff is off the charts and their head is not there. They don't have their head. Throwing 97, nasty secondary, and can't get a guy out. Well, you don't have any belief in yourself. And there's, I mean, there's different ways to build that in, but um, bottom line, I feel like that's why I had some success in this game. My major league career wasn't what I hoped for. I didn't make any money in the game, but I made it farther than I probably should have. And, you know, I'm proud. So I'm looking at your, uh, your shelf behind you and I see heads yeah. of baseball. looks like I see money ball. I see ball four. There's another, what's that, uh, coaching the mental game? So, uh, yeah, I've, I've talked before about how one of the traits, I think, of high performers is that they just, like, flip over lots of rocks looking for something that, that they're looking for. They're not sure where it is, but, yeah. you know, you have a pretty extensive library just glancing at it behind you. Um, tell me about how you kind of continue to educate yourself as a player and find new ways, because we both know at some point – you get to the point where running more hill sprints is good for you, but it doesn't make you, it doesn't get you to the next level, right? You no. sort of level off, right? Definitely. And it, to be honest, it probably wasn't that smart. It, it really wasn't. I mean, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but that's all I knew how to do. I mean, you're not going to go around and it's like our pitchers, starting pitchers aren't going to go on 10 miles every day. It's not good for you. It's science, like makes you worse actually. But um, yeah, I, I, like you said, flipping over rocks is a great way to put it. Um, when I started coaching, I, to be honest with you, I got by on straight grit and like, I'm going to do it and pull up, pull myself on my bootstraps and figure it out. But when I got into coaching, I, to be honest, I didn't know how to teach anything. I just did what I did and threw as hard as I could. It was brute strength type of stuff. And so I had to learn. I asked a ton of questions. I started reading a lot. Um, you know, I went to guys I relied on. I learned about, you know, body movements and, you know, quote unquote mechanics, you know, and everyone's got a thought on stuff. So it's, what do you believe in? What do you find works? And a lot of the stuff I was teaching early, I don't know. I don't teach anymore because I don't believe in it. Yeah. So 
Um, it's just the way it is. But I, I learned from a lot of different people as well. Um, do I take everything from everyone? No, but I take bits and pieces and I, I make it my own. And I mean, my goal is to help players and you got to find different ways to do that. Not everything works with everybody the same way. So I'm big into reading. I'm big in the middle of game. I'm, uh, I love the game. I'm just a fan of the game. I always have been and I always will be. So um, that's just part of it. Yeah. So I, I know a big thing for any coach is relating his own experience, you know, to the players they coach, obviously. So tell me about you as a pitcher. You know, I know you're a reliever, but like, who was Jeff Baginero on the mound? Um, I, I I don't know. I just I went right at guys. Um, I was. Let's start. Let's start with your role. So yeah. for most of the minor oh, okay. leagues, what was your role? I like I know, but um, right. So I, I came up out of uh, college, an eighth and ninth inning guy. I think the first first game I ever threw, I ended up getting the win in the game. Went two innings, struck out five, and I was like, awesome. My coach gave me my ball, gave me my ball with, like, the stats and the date and all that. I thought that was so cool. Um, I do that with my players now, except I did it in rookie ball when everyone got their first win or first save. But now all those guys have those, so I don't get to do it anymore. But I continue that tradition. I was pretty cool. But eighth and ninth inning guy, I closed all the way up through AAA. I was always a closer. Um, got called up to the big leagues, and then I got thrown into the, you know, you're the eighth, ninth, tenth guy in the bullpen. You're the mop-up guy. You're the rookie. You're going to go pitch whenever the game's out of control, or we have a huge lead. And to be honest with you, I didn't know how to pitch like that. No excuses. I didn't get the job done. But to be honest – I wish I would have thrown in a lot more roles in the minor leagues. I wish I would have come into the sixth inning. I wish I would have come into games where the starter couldn't get out of the fourth or whatever and go to two plus um, just for my career and my learning how to do it. I mean, I know as a power guy and max effort kind of one inning type of guy, but um, we're doing a lot more of that with our players now, you know, try not to, there's no closers. It's just, we've been doing that for a couple of years now, but I think it's invaluable. Um, because getting to the big leagues and throwing a mop-up game, every hitter on the opposing team is swinging oh oh. They are hacking because they want to get the game over with. <laughs> yeah, I know they're going to get a fastball. And what I did so well in the minor leagues, coming into a two-to-one game, half the time those teams are taking, take a strike, and I knew that I used it to my advantage and I could pound the zone, so I'd be oh one on everybody. So coming to the big leagues, I would just get crushed. <laughs> because I kept the same approach and it wasn't the smartest because I threw 92 at that point and I was my ball was straight as can be. So, um, but that's, that's, that's something I've definitely learned being a coach now. And I thought that was interesting just watching the postseason this, this year. And, uh, you know, from my seat in TV land, I, I don't like to be critical, but I was also a little confused about just the way pitchers are used in the postseason. Like on one hand, I get it. Like, we want to use our best guys. But on the other hand, I feel like everyone talks about not putting players in a chance to fail or in the, put, trying to put them in the place to succeed. And now you have guys that start all year closing games. You have guys that, uh, you know, were pitching with you all year, and they're not even pitching. And then you have other guys pitching on, you know, three innings when they've only thrown one all season. It just seems yeah. a little interesting to me where you wonder, okay, if you know that you're going to do this to these guys in the World Series, which is fine – uh, why not in September or Oct or August when it maybe you have some low pressure situations, you throw your guy in there for three innings. So he's done it one time before he does it on the biggest stage. So I, I, I can kind of relate to that. And again, I'm not going to use this time to be critical of, of major league coaching staff. Cause that's certainly not, I just wonder yeah. how, like you said, how, how well prepared are guys to do that? And is it sometimes putting them in a position to fail? Yeah, it's definitely, it's a, uh... Touchy subject, can't talk too much about that. But, you know, as yeah. a guy, it's definitely, you know, you ask questions too. I'm watching at home going, wow, that's interesting, you know. Or, you know, some guys you get it. They were priced, you get it. He's done it in the in a previous World Series. He's pitched in the ninth inning. But, yeah, for sure. I mean, they used, they used him a lot. He warmed up the night before, you know, and he started the next game. And, uh, you know, um, I think it's just more the fact that it's just survival straight, do or die. We're not going to even mess with it in the regular season because something might happen. But now if it happens, the season's over anyway. So 
Yeah, it makes sense. No, but I but it totally makes sense what you said. You know, especially with relievers, though. I mean, I think you can do it with relievers a little bit. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the game's changing now. So you know, who knows what the game might look like in five years? Like what the big league bullpen for whatever team you're coaching might look like. So I, I think you're right. Yeah. You have to prepare guys in a lot of different ways than you probably did when you were playing. So. What was your arsenal like? Were you a fastball slider guy? Were you like a live up in the zone guy? Were you sinker yeah. guy? Um, fastball coming out of college, you know, 93, 95. Um, as my career went on, I was more of a 90, 92, 93 guy. That today, I don't even have a job. <laughs> I know. Yes, people, this was back when 93 was really fast, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did have an invisible. I threw a straight 17 seam fastball that. You know, it didn't do anything, but I do believe, you know, if I had numbers on me now, I had a high spin rate. Yeah. Up in the zone for sure. Um, I had a pretty good slider. I had a spike curve that I used the lefties really only. And then I threw my last year in AAA, I finally found a changeup, which is crazy. Um, playing catch with a guy, I grabbed the ball. I grabbed the ball like, like this. And I threw it like a fastball as hard as I could, and it kind of just tumbled and knuckled. I go, well, that was weird. I don't know why I did it. And then I then I kind of altered it to more of like a three seam grip, and then I just lifted all my fingers and threw it as hard as I could, and it just it just slipped out and it bottomed, and I couldn't throw it harder than seventy eight. So hmm. like a fourteen mile an hour gap, and it I could throw it right down the middle every time and just fall. It was the only change I could ever throw. So that became a very effective pitch for me. Um, that was really it. That sounds a lot like Trevor uh, Trevor Hoffman's changeup. It was the more I've you know the long I've started looking into it, and I didn't know that it's very similar grip. His was a little different, and obviously a lot better. But um, yeah, it was. So what, so tell me about your your career aspirations, because obviously you've been climbing the ladder now, just like you did as a player, right? So you started kind of back at the bottom. You know, you're a coach in, uh, you know, the Pioneer League and then the Cal League, and now you'll be with AAA next year. So what new challenges are you looking forward to at AAA, and what uh, what do you hope for your long-term career path as a coach? Yeah, man. Um, I got into this without any career goals, which is weird. I mean, when I first got hired, I was like, I actually told my boss, I'm like, is it weird that I don't have a goal right now? Like, I don't – I'm not – driven to be a major league pitching coach right at this moment and he's like no it's not weird at all i mean you're just here to help guys and get them to the big leagues or, or get them to the next level actually you're not here to get them to the big leagues just get them to the next level and then let the next coach get them to the next level so i thought that was pretty profound but you know as i've going into my ninth year you know you see you see progression you do see you know where you've come from and, and you have a little more confidence in what you do than when you first started um um, I did have a big league interview last year. I didn't get the job, obviously, but that gave me a lot of confidence to know that I'm doing something right. It's being noticed. Not that that's what I'm looking for. Um, but you know, as a player, you're hoping to get noticed and people see what you're doing to move up as a coach. You don't really think about that. You're just helping your guys. And, you know, if someone notices great, but, um, you know, I think it'd be awesome to have a big league pitching coach job. Um, again, I still don't, I'm not worried about it. I'm not like, going, I need it next year. I just, I want to do the best I can where I'm at. And I think AAA is a great step. Um, you get to learn about, you know, the double switches. You get to learn about a lot of veteran guys. Um, hopefully get to help some guys that maybe, you know, those 4A guys that can't stick. And because that's what I was. I couldn't stick. Great AAA guy. Um, but hopefully get to help them, whether it's developing a pitch or, enhance their pitch or whatever it may be. I look forward to doing that with some guys that have been there and done it already. So Let's talk on that a little bit. What's, what's the jump like from triple a to the major leagues? Um, I mean, I haven't done it coaching obviously, but you're talking as a player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a big jump. I mean, you're, you go from triple a where guys, you got a lot of guys that have been there what they haven't stuck or, you know, there's just not room or it's not their time, you know, free agent wise. Um, it's, it's just a different animal. I mean, you're going from no crowds half the time to huge stadiums with some veteran, you know, hall of famer type players on your team at times. Um, it's just different. 
you know, a lot of times you get up there and you pitch, at least I did, I pitched away from my strengths. Um, I did not trust who I was. Um, so I can't speak to everybody. My time was very short up there. But, I mean, I remember walking into my first stadium and just being blown away and just looking around. And I mean, I, I, I took it in. I, I remember saying to myself, I'm going to take in this moment, look at this field and be overwhelmed by it. But then, no, I got to go out and pitch tonight, you know. But I still think I took some of that overwhelmingness out to the mound with me. I went, I went right at guys, but almost to a fault. You know, you can't do the same things you did um, in the minor leagues. At least I couldn't with my stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Well, I'm sure it's hard to find a balance between like, like you are you, right? And like what what you do and who you are is what got you to that level. It's what got you that promotion, right? So it's not like you want to go there and suddenly be different. But yeah. that's why I think it's probably really tough to say, like, I, I have to still be myself because myself got me here. But what do I need to do that's different? And I that's probably a really tough answer to figure out. Yeah. You've, like, had some failure time at the big league level, right? For sure. Yeah, you just you just don't know. You want to you get you get there, you're quiet, you want to put in your time and not, you know, um cause any distractions or anything. You just want to be just go to your job, be quiet. And like I did that to a fault, I think. Um funny story though, my major league debut, I had the I wore the jersey with my wrong name on the back. It was actually my jersey, it just was spelled wrong. I mean and I don't blame the guy. You try spelling my last name. <laughs> yeah, I know you have it like phonetically spelled out on your uh, Instagram yeah, page. It makes it a lot easier that way. So you have a son who's a ball player. Yeah. So tell me about some of the things you try to instill in him with all your, um, your years of experience and ups and downs. Well, I got a yeah, 11-year-old boy and a 9-year-old daughter, and I think my daughter is actually more into – Kind of, she's like the better worker, to be honest with you. Like we go in the backyard and you have to tee or whatever pitch. She she will work. She wants to do stuff. My son, he's getting a lot better, but he's like, Are we done. Like I I got some new uh, wiffle ball things the other day. They're kind of like the higher quality one, and I wanted to try them out. And I go, hey Joe, hit some of these just to see how they fly and all. That. And he goes, is this gonna turn into a lesson? I go, no, <laughs> just hit ten of them and we'll go inside again. We ended up hitting about 40, though, so, yeah, I kind of did. <laughs> but I just, I just – I don't know, man. I just love the game so much, and I realized that he has such a different path than I did. I mean, his dad has a World Series ring, and he's continu- He's coaching, I mean, at a, at a high level in professional baseball. He goes to 70 to 100 ball games a year. Like, he has a different life than I did. He's almost – like this, I would almost be like that as a kid. Like I'm, I'm done with this. It's too much. Whereas I couldn't get enough because I wasn't surrounded by it. So, yeah. you know, when I do lessons with kids, they're just like, Oh, you're a ball player. Teach me how to do this. And my son's like, it's just different life. So I'm trying to the best I can when I work with him to not be his dad and to not get on his, his butt too hard because I do not want to push him away. If he falls in love with the game, that's awesome. But I'm not going to let him hate the game because of me and what I do and the way I teach him. Because I've seen too many dads teach their kids just they're all over them. They're hard on them. They're screaming at them. It's just insane. And, you know, they might get away with it because they're not coaches. But if I do it as a coach, he's, he's going to run away from baseball. And if he doesn't want to play, that's fine. But it's not going to be because of me. Yeah. I just trying to teach him how to work, though, you know, and to stick with it because he's a tiny little dude and he's way smaller than all the other kids, just kind of like I was. But his swing is so pretty. So I'm just trying to tell him to stick with it, stick with it, stick with it. I think he put three balls in play all last year in, in Little League, not even like travel ball, like Little League. And this year he's he's crushing some balls. It's fun. Yeah, I saw a video of him the other day. He's starting to – see the fruits of his labor. And so he's starting to get it. So it's cool. That's good. Well, as we wrap up here, so I know you have a World Series ring with the White Sox. And uh, you did play with Chris Widger. I texted him the other day. You guys yeah. sound, seemed like you were just two ships sailing. Uh, but cool. what's your, uh, what's your was that your best moment in sports? Or what, what's, your, what's your, if you have one story you had to tell on your way out from baseball, what would it be? 
It wouldn't matter. Um, it really sticks with it's, you. It's definitely not the World Series ring because I wasn't even there. I, I was part of the team in September and August a little bit, but I wasn't there. I was playing in Mexico at the time, watching them win it on ESPN Day Sport Days or whatever. <laughs> feeling sick to my stomach going i wish i was in that dugout man and so i'm not bitter at all i'm really happy i was part of that team and i you know pitched a few innings that year but my moment definitely was just my major league call up it was just the culmination of everything i did in my life it was like you know i hadn't pitched in five days it was in triple as the end of the year and we're playing like three double headers in a row and i'm not pitching so i'm like i'm not helping the team I went into my manager's office the day before I got called up and I said, Hey, start me. I will start and eat up three things. Like I will do anything. We're, are we getting killed? You know, we're throwing guys three days in a row and they're like, no, nah, we'll pitch. Okay. Maybe we'll start you. Mm-hmm. Call me. He says, Hey, Baz, you're starting tonight. And I go, what? Yes. You know, and I walk out into the locker room. He goes, Hey, just kidding. Come back here. And he goes, you're going up to, you're not, you're not pitching for us. You're pitching the big league. So that was like, Again, very naive on how things worked. i never been to big league camp, wasn't on the roster, and I got called up, and I couldn't believe it. It was a great moment. So calling my wife and calling my parents and hearing them, like, cry, and it was pretty cool. And was your debut made in uh, – was it still Comiskey Park, or was it uh, Comerica, or were you guys on the road? It was at home. I'm not sure what it was called back then, to be honest. I think it was Comerica already. Yeah. Um, yeah, but my folks had flown out with my wife, and so they saw me pitch. Came in, got the first guy out, and then Ichiro did a. He got his fifth hit of the game off me. Hit a hit a chopper off the plate, like a one hop chopper over the first baseman's head, who was drawn in, holding the runner. And I'm like, oh, of course. So, I think I ended up giving up a run and losing my first game. I, I got yanked after like two, three hitters, but I didn't pitch bad, but. Yeah. And was that the very first night you were up there? You pitched the same night? Uh, I believe it was the second night. Second night. Tell me about that. Because like you said before, they tried to get you in to get your feet wet, I'm sure, in a low-pressure mm-hmm. situation. But how was that weight? Is it Was it just agony? Was it just like – Yeah, you just like, don't like, know. Did you, did it was a 7-2 to two game. It was a 7-2 to two game, and you're just like, that bullpen phone is so loud. I mean, you can hear it from the dugout and, you know – I'm just like, every time it rings, everybody kind of, is it me? Is it me? You know, your heart starts going. And then I got that call, and I'm like warming up, and I just, I couldn't feel my arm. I was just chucking. I didn't know where I was throwing it. Couldn't feel my legs. Like, and you run through the gate, and you're just like, it's it's an out-of-body experience for sure. I get to the mound, and I get my first warm-up out of the way, and, and I'm kind of fine. Um, but... Uh, I think I threw the first two pitches for strikes, so that was good. And after the first set, I'm like, all right, I'm good. And the next thing I got a hit, and then each row got a hit, and I was done. <laughs> so, but funny story, though. Not funny story, but I tell my guys this. I, I never threw a big league ball ever until the first day I got to the big leagues. So, I mean, if guys don't know, the balls are completely different. I think they're a little bit closer now, but there's still a big um, – there's still a big gap. Seems are different. Feels different. Um, so I, I couldn't throw my curveball and my slider were just completely different. My slider was terrible in the big leagues. Even my palm ball was not the same pitch. Um, so I always encourage guys to try to grab a few big league balls in off season. If you're, if you're going to go to big league camp or have a chance to get called up in big league camp, um, to throw in the off season once in a while, it's because it, it definitely hurt me. <laughs> now I've heard the same thing. One of my close friends on his major league debut, he said the exact same thing. Not not as an excuse. He was just like, that ball yeah. was just different. That ball was just very different. Right. So, And you wonder why they don't use that at like AAA or something to get guys uh, acclimated to it. it yeah, for sure. They would. I don't know why. Well, Jeff, it was an awesome talk. Uh, as we kind of conclude here, um, any final – words of wisdom you'd share with a parent or a, a young athlete. We have a lot of young athletes, a lot of parents who are trying to figure out what they should be doing, you know, with their son or, or with their daughter in softball. Um, many little tidbits before we kind of, uh, maybe you can give us your social media handles and ways people can follow up with you. 
Yeah, sure. Um, the one thing I say is that, I mean, the travel baseball and, and just the youth baseball world in general is, you know, it's nuts. It's crazy. And like almost no one plays little league anymore. And I, I get it. I just understand the competition and everyone wants a scholarship and get the pro ball for their kid. Um, you know, and do what you have to do for your kid. Um, the one thing I would just encourage parents is to, is to continue to definitely don't coddle your kids, but to build them up and empower them in a positive way. And not just to, you know, you have to do this as your job as a 12 year old, you know, you have to do this. I mean, make them fall in love with the game because if they don't love the game, it's not going to happen. You're not going to get a scholarship. if They don't love it because not every kid gets scholarship gets drafted. It's just reality. And everybody knows that. Um, but you have so little time with your kids. You got this little window of let's say five, six years, invest in them, evoke, you know, build them up, you know, and, um, I think as a parent, as a kid, they need that. I mean, it's it's just it's just huge, and there's there's too much of it being a job at this age, and some of it, you know, you got to work your butt off, like a job, but it has to be some fun involved too, man. And that's 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 the big thing. I just I just can't stand the parent screaming thing. I just can't. It's, yeah. Don't be that parent. Like, can't happen. I <laughs> just. Yeah, and I, and I was just thinking about my own story the other day about how just how much backyard baseball I played, oh, how much um, yeah. how much backyard baseball you played, and how much fun that was. Oh. And you just had that as like a thing separate from you know the 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 formal organized baseball that that was just so fun and so different and so just it just was a, a different animal. And that's where I think every kid's love grew back in the day. Yeah. Whereas now they don't have that. They only have the formalized, you know, your uniform, your cleats are shiny, you, you know, yeah, pitch, you know, all this stuff. So I think they need to get that, that like love, like you said, that they don't get in backyard baseball anymore from somewhere. And I think if it starts at home, that I, I completely agree. And I think parents need to take that on themselves and like, maybe one, two nights a week, you don't go to the indoor and hit in the cage. You go out in the backyard or whatever to the park and just get a whiffle on incredible and just play, play with a line, play, play something where it's fun. You're making up a game. And I know that's not always easy, but I'll tell you what, when I do it with my, my son and daughter, they have the best time and they don't want to quit. And when you're just working, hitting off the tee or whatever, it's, it's not the same. The look on their face isn't the same. And, and I get, you have to do those things, but occasionally get out in the yard and play, man. Cause that's where you're, you're exactly right. So how do people find you on the interwebs, Jeff? Um, I'm on Twitter. My name, my full name, Jeff Baginero, and then Instagram. I have a, I have a personal and I have a baseball one. So it's, I think it's Baginero baseball. So good luck spelling that. But... <laughs> I'm going to put some uh, text. I'm getting good at video editing. I'm learning. I'm going to put, I'm going to overlay this with text. It's going to be great. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow you up. Too, but you know, whatever. Well, Jeff, best of luck uh, this next year with your new job, AAA. It's awesome. You're one step away. And, uh, hey, I appreciate you being here. This is a, this is a great talk and a great story. I, I think uh, I, I wanted people to hear all the stuff that you've been through and just your perspective on the game because I knew it was going to be just really interesting and, and deeper because, you know, you've been through everything, the ups and downs, the minor league grind, the minor league coaching, the big league time. Um, you know, being the run of the litter and a no scholarship kind of kid. I mean, that's, I think that's more people need to realize that, like what you can accomplish, you know, for sure. Just coming from something like that. So thanks yeah. for being here, man. You got it. You know what? We didn't even talk about the five arm surgeries either. All right. 30 seconds. Give no, me, no, give no, me the no. rundown. No, no, you have that covered. I know you have the same story. So, <laughs> all right, we'll talk on talk off camera. Maybe we'll have another, a follow up episode <laughs> down the road. All right. That's great talking. I appreciate you having me, dude. All right, Jeff, take care. All right, see ya.